So um, I just want to start by um, acknowledging um, all of all of my collaborators on this work, in particular Martina Morris and, and Steve Goudreau, who are uh, really the instigators of, of the work that I've built uh, in EpiModel, and of course all this stands on all the work of the larger StatNet group, including uh, all of Carter's work and um, Pavel Kravitsky and everybody else. Um, <clears throat> so today I'm going to go through um, some motivating examples uh, for network-based epidemic modeling, um, and then have a bit of um, background and motivation for why we built Happy Model the way we built Happy Model, and the types of things that it can do, and then end with um, some of the resources to point you in the uh, right direction if you're interested in the future. Really, this like hour is condensing a five-day workshop in and of itself <laughs> called Network Modeling for Epidemics into an hour, so um, there's not much I can do, but at least I can point you in the right direction if you're interested. So um, just hearing what um, some of the topics were discussed yesterday and, and looking at your syllabus for this week, I just wanted to highlight um, at the start what I think uh, EpiModel does in terms of the um, social network analysis slash network science um, boundaries and, and where we're kind of pushing what we're able to do. Um, first, we're modeling dynamic um, contact networks. So these are temporally evolving networks with tergums, with temporal uh, ergums. Um, they are data-driven, um, so these are agent-based models of disease, but they're highly parameterized with primary and secondary data. Um, and for our network data, this is sampled egocentric data. We heard a little bit about that yesterday. Um, all of the um, kind of um, research level models that we publish in papers are also multi-layer networks. Um, and these are networks that are representing different types of contacts on the same set of nodes. So this might be, for example, um, different types of um, sexual partnerships among the, same, uh, among the same group. And each layer has a different set of formation and dissolution um, predictors in those models. One key thing here that we're doing that's complicated, but we've we figured out over time, is that there's temporal feedback between the demography and epidemiology, like everything that's going on in the population that's not the network onto the network. Um, and so they're always uh, talking back and forth between the network structure and everything else that's going on in the simulation. Um, we've also developed, because these are, um, in, in one sense, big data models, uh, a network representation framework that's rooted in um, the network package but removes a lot of the stuff that we don't need for faster simulation called network light um, that just uh, is able to represent the core um, network features of undirected um, binary networks with no missing data, and it speeds things up um, significantly. And on top of all of that, we're adding epidemics. Okay, so like the first bit that we had to do was figure out all of these network features, and then the epidemic um, simulation on top of it is, in some parts, the, the easy part. Um, so some motivating examples that are rooted in COVID. Um, uh, two papers that we did over the past couple of years. Um, one was concerning the spillover impact of COVID and what COVID did to us sociologically um, and with respect to our healthcare on HIV and STIs. And these are the diseases that I work on primarily. Um, people are still having sex, so why are STD rates dropping? The New York Times um, asked, is it because um, maybe the contact rates for sexual partnerships are declining um, or there was a blip in those contact rates for long enough that it drove down STD rates or was it because there was a disruption in access to um, STD screening services so the cases were the the infections were happening but the reported cases were not or we weren't seeing all those cases um, so we built a network-based model to explore the relative importance of those two things as they're sitting on top of each other um, with a multi-layer network for sexual partnerships. So here's this multi-layer network framework where we have three different types of sexual partnerships, main, casual, and one-off partnerships. They have the same node set, but different edge sets. <clears throat> They're primarily distinguished um, with respect to their dissolution, so how quickly they dissolve given that they exist right now. So one-off partnerships are instantaneous um, ergums, whereas uh, the main and casual partnerships have some dur durability to them. Um, but there are differences also in the formation and dissolution models. 
So um, here's what some of the results uh, look like where we, where we said, all right, we, we started the model out at um, 2019 levels and then COVID started in March 2020. Um, there was an immediate reduction in, in sexual contacts that occurred at that first uh, dashed line on the left. And what happens to HIV and what happened, that's on the left, and what happens to bacterial STIs, that's, that's what's on the right, gonorrhea and chlamydia specifically. <clears throat> the green line um, is looking at the scenario in which only sexual behavior is changing. The red line is looking at the scenario in which there's a disruption to um, services that has this um, kind of side effect of increasing risk overall. Um, and, the, and the blue line is combining those um, together. Um, long story short, um, if um, you combine them together in that blue line, the actual longer term impacts for HIV are minimal. They kind of stay at the stationary 2019 levels, but there are bigger impacts for bacterial STIs because we could have this period of sexual distancing that disrupts the overall uh, transmission dynamics if we put the two things together. Um, and then we did lots of exploratory scenarios where we looked at kind of the timing of how long um, the sexual distancing lasts versus the timing of the uh, disruption to the clinical services lasts and um, kind of mapped out all the, all the potential scenarios. This was, this was in like early 2021, so we still didn't really know how long everything was going to um, last for. Uh, another motivating example um, is, uh, is a model specifically for COVID itself um, in the cruise ship environment. Um, so who takes a cruise during a global pandemic? Apparently a lot of people in Florida. Um, and even after there were a large number of outbreaks in multiple cruise ships, people still took um, cruises. And um, there was like report after report of what was going on. Uh, one of the early outbreaks for COVID in February 2020 was in the Diamond Princess cruise ship that uh, was um, that was docked out of Japan, um, and we built a network model to try to understand what are the potential um, prevention strategies would be possible only with diagnosis and case isolation, um, given the highly structured and segmented um, network features that happen on a cruise ship, where people are passengers or crew, um, and if they're passengers, they're um, in particular cabins, particular, you know, usually with a, um, you know, a spouse or a significant other, most people travel um, in pairs. Uh, but they have like random sporadic contacts with um, other passengers and also the crew members as well. So this again was a multi-layer dynamic um, contact network in which the layers here represented um, the types of contacts that occurred from guest to guest, um, passenger to passenger, um, crew to guest, or crew to crew contacts as they evolved. We tried to um, put people in this kind of um, in this kind of diagram of a network structure where they were um, they were assigned to particular cabins and sectors of the ship, and um, there was a lot of um, um, sectorization, particularly after the outbreak was detected and they shut down um, the entire ship, meaning that people were essentially like jailed in their um, cabins until the ship came back and docked them, and there was a quarantine. Um, so we looked at different control-based strategies that, um, after the outbreak has started or prevention-based strategies, like even before the outbreak takes off, the, what, um, what was possible. Um, so these are calibrated models. These really do speak to um, external data that we're fitting the model to. We're, we take a look not just at the data related to the um, network features, but also um, you know, primary data related to case reports and fit uncertain parameters like the transmission probability and other features of the model that we, we parameters of the model we don't know a lot about um, to replicate the case curves that are observed. Um, and one of the data points that we had for, the, for this model was the actual report of cases over time across the span of um, the month that the, uh, the ship was operating. Um, on day 15 of the outbreak, the ship went into this lockdown mode, and all of the cases, um, you know, essentially like um, dropped um, because all the passengers were were contained. But we asked a lot of what if questions of what if it had been um, earlier versus later? Um, how much could we have caught if we started that um, lockdown um, at a different point? And how much could um, protective equipment like masking actually prevent in this scenario, given that most of the contacts were actually um, passenger to passenger within, um, 
you know, within the cabin. So even after the lockdowns occurred, um, it was questionable whether masking, like full-scale masking, was, was going to happen. So um, those are two examples. And I just wanted to kind of highlight what um, math modeling for epidemics is doing in general for the, for the non-epidemiologists in, um, in the audience and show how it kind of nicely interfaces for, with, with network science methods. Um, epidemic dynamics are um, inherently characterized by a lot of nonlinearities. We see this in um, emerging um, exponential growth for emerging infectious diseases, a case like Ebola outbreaks in West Africa, um, but also prevention strategies for the scale of things like vaccines um, for cholera, um, where there is uh, potential for indirect benefit from um, others in the community that are um, receiving this vaccine. This is called the, the herd immunity effect. Um, this is largely driven by the fact that there's this ongoing feedback loop um, between the population and the individual. So if the overall rate of infection or the force of infection is, is um, driven by um, your rate of contacts um, plus the transmission probability per contact, um, those might stay the same, but what might change always over time is the prevalence of disease in the, in the population. It might go up and down, and so the overall number of, of cases that are happening, the incident cases that are happening at any time point are uh, constantly changing. Those same type of nonlinearities happen on networks too. Um, so um, this is a nice um, paper from Martina Morris um, demonstrating that even small changes in the, um, in the mean degree shifting people from um, one to multiple partners has a dramatic impact on the overall connectivity of the network. And you can imagine from a pathogen perspective um, which um, network that a particular virus would rather be um, sitting on top of and, and flowing through. So um, Jim had this uh, great introduction on agent-based models in, in general, and I just wanted to compare um, kind of what's going on in terms of generating networks um, in, in epidemiology, um, because there are a lot of instances in, in, in epi and in, in epidemic modeling where um, they're called network models or models on networks, um, but they're, they're actually more agent-based models, and I want to draw a contrast between those two things. Um, Many agent-based models um, in, for epidemiology, the network is an emergent property from a series of dyadic choices, uh, individual level or dyadic choices. Um, and there are different approaches to constructing that overall network, um, but a most common one is this, is this so-called stub matching algorithm. I'll show you an example of that in a second. In contrast, a statistical network model, um, like an ergum or a tergum, has either a global or an individual dyadic representation, um, and we have a, um, a regression model approach to provide an inferential link between um, those levels. Um, so um, in, um, in a lot of um, agent-based models, the network generating algorithm kind of looks like this. Um, this is an example from a, um, a large-scale, long-developed HIV model called EMOD, developed by the uh, Institute for Disease Modeling um, that has uh, heterosexual contacts between men and women. Um, and they generate a network by having essentially like men line up in a queue um, and there's a propensity for age mixing. So like selecting partners that are close in age to yourself that's rooted in data. Um, the men in the queue have a certain like you know, um, uh, possibility of different uh, female partners, and if the highest probability match is available, then they'll match with that partner, and then they move on to the next person in the queue. Um, and if that match is not available, then they'll go to like the next um, available partner in, in the list, in the less, least preferred list. Um, so that seems like it might work out pretty well for actually generating a network structure, um, but one of the challenges, um, if we look at the network from a top-down perspective, is that if we have uh, one or two rules for the network generation, um, we might do pretty well, but if we start to have more and more rules for what generates what um, actually goes into to, um, the formation and dissolution of partnerships, um, things can break down pretty quickly. Um, from a top-down perspective, it might look like um, anyone, any focal node, like the node that's uh, highlighted in black here, um, has a kind of independent set of choices of what partners to select. But if we look at it from a global network perspective, 
any one of those choices has different implications for the other partners of partners in the network and generating different distributions of um, degree and concurrency and other um, features that we might be interested in the model. Um, it's often difficult within stub matching algorithms to abstract from the algorithm to ask counterfactual questions. So what happens if the degree changes and everything else might um, stay the same? So instead, we use ergums, um, and you've probably seen this formula a uh, hundred times already this week, um, but this is, this is our general approach. Um, the network data that we feature in, in network-based epidemic models varies, um, and we, use, we can use a combination of primary and secondary data. Um, a lot of the work that I do in my group um, goes out and collects um, primary network data for incorporation specifically into these types of models. Um, so we use an egocentric network framework. I heard about that yesterday, um, in which um, we go out, and go out into the world and um, ask people about their contacts, um, sample the egos and ask people about their contacts, um, both about the features of the contacts and the features of the um, partnerships or the contacts um, um, them, themselves, so edge level covariates and nodal level covariates. <clears throat> One example of this in the HIV context is the, um, my ArtNet study. So this went out, and this is a web-based study that collected data on about 5,000 men and uh, 16,000 of their partnerships. And um, we collected all that we needed um, to do all of our um, HIV and STI um, modeling. What we're building into um, these agent-based models now with the integration of this data and Turgums is also other GLMs, other generalized linear models, to do that same type of regression analysis and then prediction um, from the data where we have primary line level data. Um, and I think this is kind of unique in terms of um, disease simulation models is we can have a full scale model that takes um, data in various um, components of the processes that we're interested in modeling and simulates from it or predicts from it um, in ways that address things like confounding um, and stratifications and interactions that um, are often a challenge for many agent-based models that only take marginal distributions across like all of their parameters. Uh, here's another um, set of studies where we're doing this for respiratory diseases. So I work in TB, I work in COVID, um, and I've um, worked also in um, uh, correctional health settings, so jails and prisons, um, for the transmission of different respiratory diseases. All of these studies are kind of using um, data diaries uh, or, or contact diaries to collect um, the recent contacts that people have had over a certain um, period of time and aspects of those contacts that are relevant for disease transmission. So um, on the left-hand side is the, is the data, on the right-hand side is some model for the process, um, and, and this can be very flexible related to the, the question of interest. Um, I wanted to show you an example of what it looks like for our um, HIV transmission models for, among men who have sex with men. Again, these are multi-layer networks, so this is just one formula for one formula out of three that we're using. Um, where the propensity for forming edges is a function of um, uh, edges, so like overall density, um, mixing on age and race, heterogeneity in um, mean degree in age and race, um, and then some non-parametric degree distribution terms, um, mixing on um, sexual role class. Um, and I also want to highlight here what allows us to be a multi-layer network is that there's a term for heterogeneity and degree of one network as a function of degree in another network. So we're looking time step by time step to see what their, a person's casual degree is and then feeding that into the main network model to determine uh, the main degree. And as you might imagine, if you have a high casual degree, you have a low main network degree and vice versa. So they're kind of adaptive and they can change over time fit the model and hopefully it fits and do lots of diagnostics on it and simulate it forward. <clears throat> now the critical thing for infectious disease modeling for this framework to work um, and spend years and decades to test this out on a lot of edge cases is that these properties hold, um, these fit properties hold even if the network size and the composition changes. And so that's um, the next thing I want to talk about 
is just to show you how that kind of feedback occurs um, and what we do about it and how it's, um, how it's built into um, EpiModel. So more generally, we have to always think about time within epidemic modeling um, and, uh, and modeling o over networks. And Jim talked about this a little bit of whether we're modeling, um, modeling on networks or modeling of networks or putting the two together. Um, but one of the key questions we have to ask is whether the um, nodes are changing, whether the edges are changing over time um, uh, or both. Um, and for different diseases, um, we make different choices based on the time scale of those diseases. For an acute immunizing infection like COVID, um, we may get away just fine with having a static network because things move across that network so quickly and the length of the um, edges, the duration of say your family or household or office-based contacts is longer than COVID is. Um, for something like HIV, the partnerships that you have for, for sexual partnerships might last um, months or years, but HIV is a lifelong disease of decades, and so we always have to take into account the fact that um, the rate of change in the network is faster than the rate of change in the overall, um, in terms of the overall disease. So we have to make that decision, um, and we also have to ask, um, if it is dynamic, how does the network adapt to all of the changes that occur um, within the population structure over time? So the first bit is easy for me um, as, the, as a non-statistician um, because it's already been developed by Pavel and um, lots of other people on the StatNet team, but we're using Turgums to um, model how, um, how the network edges are changing over time as a function of a formation and a dissolution model that are linked but that are independent. Um, but we might ask, um, different types of questions of this evolving network and make different decisions about um, how to incorporate all of the other processes that we care about for the disease transmission process. On the simplest level, um, we might just ignore everything else besides the network um, and have some summary measure that quantifies how quickly a pathogen could move through a network, say if the transmission probability were 100%. If as soon as you got into contact with another person, there was a transmission event. And there's this nice measure called the forward reachable path that quantifies this um, for dynamic networks. Um, it's built in within the temporal SNA package, TSNA, um, and uh, we nicely summarize it here in the, in the HIV context, but essentially it's counting up the, the reachability over time as people are forming and breaking those edges. So you have this um, uh, indirect connection with partners and partners. In one sense, this is somewhat analogous to um, an r naught measure in, in, um, in epidemic dynamics. So that might be your first step, but when we want to introduce um, epidemics into the network, we have to think about what the um, relationship and the feedback between um, the epidemic dynamics and the network structure will be. Many um, models of epidemics on network assume something like the middle um, here where there's no feedback between the two. So what happens is there might be a dynamic network that's simulated over a time series from time one to time n, and then we go back um, to time one and simulate <clears throat> the disease dynamics on that already simulated network. <clears throat> and that assumes that um, everything else in the model besides the network simulation has no um, interacting effect on the network simulation itself. If that's not the case and there is interaction or feedback, what we have to do is time step by time step do a re-simulation of the network that takes into account all of the other updates um, in the population and do this um, every single time step. And there's a, there's a constant look back and forth in between the two um, components of the model. So what might, <clears throat> what might change over time? Um, in the epi context, the node set might change or the attributes of the nodes might change. The node set can change in epidemic models due to demographic churn, births, deaths, and migration. Um, and this can either be slow and incremental or shocks to the system. Sorry, I'm just gonna go. So the demographic churn might be slow and incremental, like a longer term uh, growth in a population size over time, or it might be a shock to the system 
as might occur with a very deadly disease like Ebola or some network shock like what happened on the cruise ship. Um, in addition to that, attributes of the nodes might change. Um, key attributes that we care about are those that are actually referenced in the ergum formula. So if the attributes that are in the ergum formulas that, that guide things like age mixing or mixing on degree on diagnosed uh, disease status are changing over time, those attributes are changing and therefore the network simulations have to adapt to those changes um, over time. Also here relevant is that idea of the multi-layer networks where um, the current degree in one network influences the degree in the other networks over time. <clears throat> Fortunately, for the, latter, for the latter issue of changing nodal attributes, there's been a lot of study to see that this performs in a um, predictable, uh, usually predictable uh, way in, that takes into account like what's happening in the network. But the first issue, when the node set is changing, gets a little bit more complicated, and we've developed some adjustments and workarounds to deal with this um, in, in EpiModel. <clears throat> so the first issue happens when the network size and composition changes. Um, if we just apply the coefficients for a tergum as is without any adjustment, when we have a network of changing size, we're going to have density that's preserved in the network that might not be um, what is intended um, given, you know, sociological data that, that says, you know, when people move to different um, population sizes, they tend to preserve mean degree over density. Um, but fortunately, um, preserving the um, mean degree requires just a, a minor adjustment to the edges coefficient within the model to update um, based on the population size. Um, so this is equivalent to partitioning the original edges term into an offset um, and then updating the offset as the, as the population n changes um, over time. Another complication for what happens with vital dynamics is the fact that relations tend to break up when one of the partners in a relation dies. Um, and this is largely inconsistent for how we collect data and we parameterize them within models. So when we're fitting our, our dynamic network using static data, such as the examples that I show, they're usually reporting on contacts that they've had in the past you know, three months or year or whatever time frame. And those are usually living contacts. Um, and there might be an overall propensity for, for partnership dissolution that's a function of the average duration of, um, of those contacts or partnerships. Um, we had no information about death within those network data that we collected. Um, and so if we simply put that into the model and don't make any adjustment, <clears throat> Even if we correct the overall population size using the formula that I showed in the previous model, we'll see two features of the network reduce um, below the expected values that we want. And one of those is the average duration of the relationships, because as people are dying, they're reducing the length of the durations that are coming out of the simulations. And two, the average number of relations are also drawing that down. So both of those um, factors uh, in, our, in our model diagnostics will be off. Some of that might be actually desired. We might actually want a network that's responsive to those demographic features um, in, in one sense that if we have a huge outbreak that kills off a large portion of the population, we might want to account for that in the, in the fact of the models um, reducing um, the, the mean degree of the population and reducing the, the durability of relationships. But in many cases, that's not the case and it's an artifact of our data collection and not what we want to actually build within the model. So we have another correction to be able to handle this um, and we call this the, the so-called death correction. Um, and we basically um, adjust for this competing risk of edge dissolution that's on top of the already uh, calculated um, dissolution rate of edges that, that is in the model. And we add this basically an extra bump of how long relationships will last that take into account this competing risk. This gets a little complicated for um, 
uh, dissolution models that are non-homogeneous, meaning that they're not edges-only dissolution models where there's some structure into um, uh, the average duration of, of edges that um, might take into account attributes and, and mixing in things, but um, it generally follows this, this form. So those are the kinds of things that we have to think about and work through when we're um, figuring out how to adapt a turgum um, into a context where there are exogenous changes to the population or network structure over time that are, um, in one sense, interfering with what the turgum does. Um, and with all that figured out um, and, and built into software, then we can start um, putting some epidemics on top of it. And this is, in one sense, again, the, the easy part. Um, the dynamic network structure um, in an epidemic modeling framework, I like to think about as um, like a big force of infection parameter. Instead of having one parameter, well, like one lambda parameter in an SIR model, you have this massive parameter that's feeding in all the features of um, how contacts are occurring and how they're changing over time. As long as we have that, and put it into an agent-based model for a disease um, transmission in the right place, That's, that is the, the transition between being a susceptible person and an infected person in the population, um, then all of the general theory and framework and rules that we have for building an epidemic model, whether it's in a compartmental framework or an agent-based model framework, um, then, then follow through. So um, we can embed something like a complicated turgum in a um, simple SIR model for something like measles, um, or we can get more complicated and use that um, turgum in a, in a more complex model for something like HIV, where there's many other components of the disease, transmission, progression, behavioral, clinical processes that we also want to um, be able to represent. So the EpiModel software tries to bring um, all of these um, tools and methods together in a single um, software package um, that, um, that you can use for multiple purposes. Number one, for teaching and learning about um, how to build models on networks. And number two is then taking what's in the built-in package and extending it out for um, research level models for, to answer new questions. So, um, in one sense, this, um, this package, EpiModel, sits on top of a very big um, family tree of, of StatNet and uses all of the coding and methodological framework that has been developed in all these StatNet packages. So it plays nicely with StatNet and it builds on top of StatNet. Um, and we can do things like um, making animated movies of networks using like the StatNet NDTV package, um, using all the tools that you might have, have um, already learned. So like I said, um, EpiModel is designed for both um, learning and, and research extensions. Um, and the underlying goal with, with this development is to build a singular tool that can do both at the, at the same time and using the same kind of language and, and syntax. So we have a series of built-in epidemic models where you can just run them out of the gate and, and not um, change anything about the um, the disease structure itself, you can just say, I want an SIR model um, or an SIS model and um, be able to simulate that. Um, and then you can take that same framework and like build out um, you know, structure to the disease system that might be relevant for your research questions. So um, for the built-in models, they, they look um, you know, as simple as these compartmental frameworks for something like a, um, measles or another SIR disease. What's fixed within the built-in models are the disease states um, and the transitions between those states. And what's modifiable are the parameterization of um, everything related to the, um, the network and everything related to the um, actual like, transition rates for the epidemic itself. <clears throat> the general workflow for EpiModel is listed here um, and follows um, this kind of idea that we're working with egocentric, sampled egocentric network data, but that's not, um, it's not required. We can work with observed, an observed census of the network um, and input it as a, as a network object into, into EpiModel, but usually we're working with some kind of sample data um, because of the population scale that we're concerned about simulating a disease across um, are not fully observable. 
So we have a, a data structure that we're, um, that we're setting up with attributes. We're parameterizing and fitting a Turgum um, and diagnosing the model fit to make sure that it's a good model, then parameterizing an epidemic model, simulating an epidemic, and analyzing all of the simulation data from it. And there's a series of functions that do each one of these steps um, with an epi model um, and help you, help you along the way. Um, in terms of extending epi model, we take what we had within the built-in models and then say add a new piece to it. So we have a built-in model for an SIR epidemic, but if we want an SEIR epidemic, the E is the exposed or latent state within a model that um, all COVID models have, uh, you know, an SEIR representation. There's some period in which um, you're exposed to the infection, but no longer, but not yet able to transmit to other people. That's the E state. What do we do within the disease model? Well, we can code up a module um, for epi model that essentially represents that independent state and the transition that those new transitions that are encoded um, in the model related to infection and disease progression that weren't in the base model. How to do that? Well, it involves a bit of code, um, and so you have to get comfortable with that. Um, but we have a lot of um, resources to do that. And I just wanted to show you one example of the fact that um, people um, have, have used EpiModel for these purposes all the time. This is my favorite example of a, a research extension for EpiModel to model vaccination of Hawaiian monk seals um, against uh, influenza. Um, and they, so they had network data on seals. They had a um, specific, um, you know, um, uh, representation of influenza that they had to code up and build. Um, and they put the two together with an epi model for this, um, for this nice paper. So I just wanted to show you um, at the end here um, some of the resources that we have available. <clears throat> um, the principal resource for all of our training materials is our website for the Network Modeling for Epidemics course. So this is a week-long summer course, um, formerly at the University of Washington. This year and last year, we've been taking a break to kind of uh, rethink and redevelop all of our materials, and we're going to be coming back next year in person um, in, in Atlanta. But still, all of the materials for the course are up and online and available for self-study, and so you can work through all the materials um, that are here at this link. I just wanted to show you um, briefly an example of, of what it looks like to kind of build, uh, to work with a, uh, a built-in model and the types of data uh, and analyses that you can do even right out of the gate without, um, you know, building out any fancy extensions. So all of our course materials are, like, um, designed around the sequence um, in which we're building up from simpler models to complex network models. And I'll just go to um, one example from the third day when we start um, modeling diseases across networks. Um, this is an SIS type of epidemic. So SIS means like susceptible, infected, susceptible. So people can go back and forth between infections and non-infected states, something like a bacterial infection like gonorrhea. Um, so uh, we get started by setting up um, the network, um, parameterizing the, the model for the network, um, using some sufficient statistics for, um, for the key features of the network that we care about. Um, again, these are rooted in the idea that we have egocentric network data that we've summarized in the appropriate way. We're parameterizing both the formation and dissolution model, um, estimating the model. This is estimating the, the Turgum. Uh, running diagnostics um, on it and ideally having um, pictures of the diagnostics that look something like this where we have <clears throat> where we have the simulation sitting um, right on top of the of the target statistics <laughs> once we get through uh, running the diagnostics um, and we can parameterize the um, epidemic model and the epidemic simulation the built-in models come with a kind of core set of epidemic parameters um, that are unique to the disease uh, class that you're modeling um, out of the box. Um, and you can simulate the epidemic model um, and then start to work with the data um, here. So plot the, 
all the epi curves um, in different ways. Um, look at the network object um, that's color coded by the disease status. Um, and have other, you know, um, time specific um, data summaries that might be of interest. So um, looking at the dynamic um, edge list from the dynamic network might be of interest if you want to track through the specific uh, contacts that occurred over time. Uh, you can export the data and work with it in different formats. Um, and so the other tutorials within this material just take this kind of framework and build upon it and show you how to build things like counterfactuals for the networks. Um, um, so in this example, we're building a, a counterfactual um, model for what happens when we change the degree distribution in a, like a heterosexual transmission model in which there's, it's essentially a bipartite model um, where there's no contacts between um, um, people of the same group, but we model that um, in a slightly different way here with a node match term um, instead. So like no mixing between um, groups. Um, sorry, that's so small. And the types of outputs that we get are, are similar. And um, just to show you just at the end, you know, plotting the networks, um, we also have some features that are, um, might be of interest to um, epidemiologists um, that uh, include being able to export things like a phylogram, which is the kind of transmission tree from one edge to the next, um, uh, one node to the next node that they're infected in that sequence, um, be able to work with that data and maybe compare it against um, some genetic sequence data um, if those are available. So all the course materials are organized here and um, they end up the week with um, working on those model extensions for how to build the, um, how to build the extensions like adding different compartments to the epidemic model, adding um, different types of uh, interventions um, into, the, into the model um, with all the, um, all the tutorials organized around these R Markdown um, tutorials that you can work through and read through at your, at your own pace um, and run all the R code that's, um, that's included in there. A couple of the resources that might be of interest um, that are linked on, on these slides. Um, our main um, software presence is, is on GitHub at this link here. Um, it's a useful place to ask us questions, to interact with us as developers and epidemiologists, file bug reports, and, and can actually contribute to the code as um, some of our users had. We have a gallery of um, examples um, called the EpiModel Gallery that it might be a little intimidating to um, take a built-in model and figure out how to extend it for a complicated um, research question. And so the gallery um, is intended to be a kind of pathway or a template um, for how to do that. So you might say, all right, I want to add, I want to take an SIR model and add that extra E, uh, like exposed state. Well, we have an example of how to do that. Um, and it, it, we have a kind of description of, of what that involves, um, some model code, um, and what the actual um, uh, coding up that, that actual um, module looks like that, get, that then gets plugged into EpiModel. Um, many of the models that we run on, on research level um, scales are um, big and long to run because um, we're, we're building models on hundreds of thousands of nodes. Um, and in part that's due to the fact that we're trying to represent like full scale population sizes. And in another part that's to, to figure out um, kind of stable estimates for disease properties in small subgroups. So you might have a large population of 100,000 um, people, but like a small subgroup of a couple thousand of those um, that you care about, you know, delivering intervention to. So you really need a, a very large um, network simulation to be able to um, adequately represent the small subgroup. So we have this add-on package called EpiModel HPC for high-performance computing systems um, that allows you to work with EpiModel on a HPC um, that you might have access to through universities or elsewhere um, and scaling up different jobs and scenarios um, accordingly. And lastly, um, there are 
83 and counting um, scientific publications that have used EPI models. Some of those are not network models, they're, they're compartmental models, um, but that might be inspiration for thinking about how to use EPI model based on what others have done, including that um, Hawaiian monk seal model. That's all I have today. I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> So originally, yeah, sure. So, so can epi model be used for modeling um, uh, other diseases that are not infectious, or maybe even social diffusion processes, or things like that? Yeah. Right. Um, and the short answer is yes, as long as you have network data um, for them, or some um, kind of rooted, you know, or kind of theory in, in how to like parameterize a network model um, based on that, and maybe it's it's um, purely theoretical model that that's sufficient for doing that. Um, we, have a, we have a great example in that gallery that I just showed um, for a social diffusion model, okay? And so this is um, kind of similar to the complex contagion model that Jim was showing where it doesn't take just a person-to-person -person contact for transmission of susceptible to infected, but it's like the number of um, edges that you have in your, uh, in your immediate neighborhood um, and for a diffusion to happen. So our primary group is epidemiologists and we don't work on these models you know, a lot, but there are some, um, a handful, five or 10 of the um, published models in, in that wiki page that have done something like this. So like network diffusion on computer networks, network diffusion on um, sociological networks too. So you can take a look at those. Um, yeah, so the question is, can you use EpiModel uh, kind of to understand historical patterns in disease dynamics or something that happened, uh, that's happened in history? Yeah, so um, yes, you can, but one of the challenges is, um, is whether it's rooted in data or whether like the, the data to uncertainty ratio is too, is too low. Are you gonna have enough network related data from the 1980s, if that's where you want to start out to be able to answer these network questions, or is it going to be more of a theoretical model where you're just asking, what if things were the same back you know, 30 years ago, or what if they differed and what could have produced the model today? So in contrast to some compartmental, like differential equation models that really try to um, map out like the historical trajectory of infectious disease dynamics over decades, with um, the reason that they can do that is because they have simple parameterization. They have like one force of infection parameter that they just calibrate to like a case curve that happens over time. These models have many, many potential parameters. There's you know, so many ways that you could, you could parameterize the network components of the model. Do you have um, sufficient certainty to be able to do that? Yeah. Thank you. But we do have a paper um, in, um, in the list there. Um, the primary author is Steve Goudreau, and it's in Lancet HIV, that it's looking at the um, historical HIV disparities by, by race in the United States. That's trying to answer that question with, with network models, so that might be some inspiration to see what, what's possible. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how do we take into account um, antiretroviral therapy and HIV models and um, kind of like some of the longer term effects that that might have? And it, it, depends, on, it depends on the model. We've, we've been pretty consistent about how we've modeled this. 
it basically just gets added as a module like this to this complicated model where we're tracking things like viral load and CD4 count as they evolve over time. And antiretroviral therapy has the impact of increasing longevity, um, keeping people alive longer, and decreasing viral load, and thus decreasing the transmission rate for infected, infected people. And we parameterize that based on some you know, clinical trial data that, that shows how quickly um, people respond to ART and um, how often they fail um, treatment, like how often you know, the treatment leads to um, morbidity and mortality. Um, but that's one of the many pieces of the model that, that we had for each of you. Yeah, so uh, the question is, are there tools for metapopulation models, so like multiple networks spread across different, different communities? Um, uh, I just worked on a um, paper with um, uh, someone who was, who was doing this in a, uh, like a tribal environment in, in Bolivia, where these, these isolated villages, and each one of the um, villages had um, you know, little sub-networks that were unconnected, um, kind of like a block diagonal constraint, so they weren't, they weren't um, connected to each other, um, and they were connected in the, in the, broader, in the broader network. So we were able to do that um, because each one of those sub-networks were relatively small, these little small villages. It gets really challenging, I think, to think about this on a, um, like a bigger connected population level where you might have a, a, a model for influenza across the United States in each city and, and they're, they're, all, they're all connected, um, mainly due to the computational constraints. There's, there's only, there's kind of like a cap on the, on the computational cost of fitting um, ergums with um, you know, millions of nodes, um, but otherwise it's conceptually possible. Yeah, I can I can send you that link to that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.